We're going to be preaching about the deadly nature of sin, and we are in part two, overcoming defeat. Last week, we spoke about the deadly nature of sin, the rape of deception, how we violate ourselves when we cater to sin, when we live in sin, when we sin and we love it, and we enjoy it, and we're having a good time, and then we feel like we can come back to God, and He forgives us, and He does. Don't get me wrong, but there does come a point where it, it will become very, very difficult for us to be able to hear the word of God. And we may not have a person to tell us what is right or what is wrong in our lives because we're no longer listening to what God wants to tell us. I know, I know quite a few individuals that say that they are Christians. I cannot say that they are not Christians. However, they live a life as if God did not exist. And we call that being a practical atheist. They say they believe in God, but they do everything that the world does and yet say that they believe in God. What is the difference? The Bible is clear that we are known by our actions. No one knows what is in your heart just like no one knows what is in my heart. God is the only one that sees our hearts. He can reveal it to someone else if he so desires. However, people see our actions. People, you can see who I hang out with. You can hear how I speak. You can go on Facebook and you can see the pictures that I post there and the writings that I put. And you can say, oh, what? Why did he post such a thing? That is not in character with the man of God he claims to be. And you can call me on that. But it is so important that we live lives that honor God. And in today's sermon, part two of the deadly nature of sin, I want to speak about for a little while an overcoming defeat. Because I believe at some point, all of us have been defeated by sin. We have been overcome by sin. Sin has dragged us down. Uh, sometimes it dragged us down unwillingly. And other times, we grabbed sin's hand and said, take me. And we went with the sin. And this really is a, a, a follow-up to a message that I preached last year, which was talking about overcoming a, a bad habit. But I was able to change it into um, overcoming defeat by vanquishing sin in our lives. But it really is up to us to do it. God will never conquer sin in your life or in my life when we willingly sin. That is not going to occur. God will allow us to have our way. Our God is a good God. He never forces someone to serve Him. He says, come. He says, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. And so He welcomes us to the banquet table. And He says, I have, I have life spread out before you. However many years we have left, we just read in Psalm 139 that God is the one that has ordained the days of our lives. He wrote them down in our book. He knows exactly how long you and I will live. We are not a party to that. We do not know. But he has ordained our days. How much do we have left? We don't know. I know how much I have spent already. But I don't know what's left for me. And so God wants us to be aware that every day that we live should be spent in honoring Him. Now that does not mean that we're praying all the time or that we're reading the Bible all the time. Obviously we have jobs, we have school, we have other things that we do. But in what mindset do we live our life? Do we live a life of constant defeat and woe is me and things are so bad and this life stinks? Maybe. That may be our life, unfortunately, but because we have chosen to live a life like that. Mm -hmm. However, when we choose to live a life that honors God, you know what? You may wake up in the morning tired, but knowing God will see me through. Amen. You may wake up in the morning in pain, as some of us may be in pain today, but you'll be, but I'm going to go serve God today. I'm going to go to church. And that's not to say that those that didn't make it Amen. is anything negative about them. However, we all made a choice to be here today to hear the word of God, to honor God, and to seek to be in the right place at the right time with the proper clothing and with the right mindset to do the will of God. 1 John 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, what is in this world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Mm -hmm. So there are some things, and let me tell you, God created everything. We just saw in that beautiful video, God's creation, the waterfalls and the trees and, and the plants, even the fire that, that that person made was something that God gave us the ability to do, to keep us warm and, and to use. However, there are other things that are in this world that were not from God's creation, but come from others 
who oppose God. So for example, the desires of this flesh. What does our flesh desire? Our flesh desires comfort at all costs. Our flesh desires good and beautiful things. Nothing wrong with that. But at what price and at what cost? When is it that we decide, I am going to desire what God desires? But the only way we can know God's desires is by reading the word of God. It, that doesn't come into your mind if you are not reading what God says. And the only way we can know that is by reading the Bible. It's not a matter of understanding the Bible. It's a matter of reading the Bible. There are many versions of the Bible, and we speak on, on the following Thursdays. We're going to be speaking about that, various versions of the Bible. Why are there so many? But it doesn't really matter. The Bible is there. Whoever wants to know the mind of God can know the mind of God by reading the Word of God. However, this flesh desires everything that will gratify it. So I want to eat. Nothing wrong with that. But when I make that an idol, that's a problem. I want to have sex. When I make that an idol, that's a problem. I want to have money. When I become materialistic about the money, that is a problem because now I am placing that before God. I want to have good things. I want to have a nice car. I want to have a good job. I want to, to be physically fit. But all of that be can become an idol when I place it before what God wants to be in my life. So we have to be clear that the desires of the flesh, not all of them are negative desires, but some of them may oppose the things of God. And then here come the desires of the eyes. How much can we see? Wow. These eyes continue to devour the world around us and they never stop. They're always seeing things and continue to see things. And the desires that come into us through our eyes sometimes are dangerous desires because perhaps we are looking upon things that we should not be looking upon. And finally, the pride of life. What is the pride of life? Well, the pride of life is any of those things that, again, are not necessarily evil, but they become evil to us because inordinately we desire them. That, that is the pride of life, where we take something and we say, God, wait a minute, I want this now. And God says, you got your minute, not a problem, but I won't be with you. And that is a dangerous place to be. And I'm not talking about the loss of salvation, but I am talking about the loss of health, the loss of time, the being set back in our seeking of God. Because we can make decisions that God is not in, and God will say, go ahead and do it, but they'll set us back a year. Five years, 10 years, 20 years, they can set us back a lifetime because we decided to do something. Let's not blame anybody else for what we have desired. Let us say, hey, I did the wrong thing. I will suffer the consequences of it and I will honor God. And that's it. And we move on. There is besetting sin. Besetting sin is whatever sin comes against us and it's almost as if it were right beside us. And this is ungodly behavior that we can't just shake off. These are things that we do and, and it's almost like, like when I work on the garden, uh, for example, there's um, some kind of vine that it, it holds on to you and you have to pull it off a bunch of times or it won't let go. That is besetting sin, that it kind of clings to us. And the more you focus on it, the more it clings to you. But you know, when you nurture sin and when you hug sin and when you love sin, it's going to love you right back. And it's going to stay there with you. But you know what? When you desire to stop it, it's not going to want to stop. It's going to pursue you. Let's use the word, it's going to stalk you. Because now it is in your mind. Now it is in the back of your head. Now you may dream with it. Even after you prayed and you fasted and you read the word of God, it keeps on cropping up. Because at one point you nurtured it. And that is very, very dangerous. Sometimes, no matter what we do, it is as if it were inescapable. The only way that the power of sin is broken is through death. Once you and I die, it will be impossible for us to sin. Now, I'm not talking about committing suicide here, but there is something that God has provided for us. It says here, you must die to lose the sin. The old you must be put to death, and the new you must stay resurrected. So that is what God is going to do. It. And in this sermon, I'm going to break that down. But uh, a particular book that I use in my seminary class called uh, an article in there called Pauline Psychotherapy, written by Robert C. Roberts, says this. The Christian life is characterized 
by ongoing defensive suicidal action against bad personality remnants mm. or against sin. So we are constantly killing that person in us that seeks to sin. And we need to do that all the time. Edward Welch writes another book and he calls these bad habits or this sin a banquet in the grave. Could you imagine? A banquet in the grave. Corpses having a good time, but they're dead. No live person can participate in that. See, a party with corpses is no party, but some people are there indulging their dead flesh while claiming to live for God. So I want you to understand, right? we're talking about the deadly nature of sin, overcoming defeat. However, when we continue to sin, when we continue to nurture sin, when we continue to desire relationships that God is not in, we are dying more and more to God and living for the sin. However, when we ask God to resurrect us from that death that we have chosen, well, now we die to the sin and we live for God. Romans 8, 5. To 8.9 eight, says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. So if I'm living for the flesh, my flesh is being gratified. My flesh is being built up. My carnal desires, they increase. Remember, the more you want something, the more you're going to want it and want it and want it and want it more. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And only God knows what the Spirit desires, but He reveals it to us as we seek Him. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So it is only by being guided by the Spirit of God that we will have life and peace. Verse 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. When I desire to do things against the will of God, I am making myself an enemy of God. Now, you and I may have some enemies. But the last one you want to be your enemy is God. Because you can run from the devil to God. But from who, from where do you run to when God is your enemy? Who's going to help you? Nobody can help you. And so we need to consider that. That we need to allow our mind to be governed by the spirit. Because our flesh in no way, there is absolutely no way that our flesh will seek God. Those who are in the realm of the flesh, says verse 8, cannot please God. But verse 9 says, you, talking about us, Paul was writing to the Romans, but this is inclusive, uh, inclusive of the church. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you. So I want you to consider today. So today is the day of salvation, right? Not tomorrow and yesterday is gone. If you are not living in the Spirit, that today you would begin living in the Spirit and you would seek to do the things of God. So what are the steps that we need to do? I have four steps here. Number one, so that we can overcome defeat. We can overcome the sin that so easily besets us, that continues to pursue us. Number one, recognize and acknowledge your sin and call it by name. That is really important. We cannot cover it up. I, I, it really bothers me it, and extremely, extremely bothers me when uh, a preacher or a pastor will gloss over sin. You can't gloss over sin. People go to hell because of sin. People die because of sin. Jesus was crucified because of sin. The wrath of God came upon Jesus Christ because of sin. So when a preacher or a pastor or anyone glosses over sin, they're saying that the blood of Christ that he shed was a minimal thing was a tiny thing was not an important thing and we have to be careful about that kind of thing so step one recognize and acknowledge your sin and call it by name be specific don't whitewash it call it what it is be honest with yourself even if the truth hurts the presence of jesus the goodness of jesus the light of jesus exposes sin when we see jesus we see hope so again <clears throat> recognize acknowledge Call it by its name. You know what? So that we can identify exactly what it is. Number two, make up your mind to stop it now. 
Stop it. You must stop it. We must stop. Whatever it is that is keeping us away from hearing the voice of God. God is always talking. I believe the Lord continues to speak to us day after day after day. Those who claim they cannot hear the voice of God is because they are not listening to the voice of God. Or there is something blocking their ability to hear the voice of God. So we need to make up our mind to stop the sin now. Sins often are formed very subtly and gradually, but they have to be stopped cold turkey. We know, we know that saying, right? A commentator, uh, in other words, we have to stop the sin abruptly and immediately. A commentator says that cold turkey is a food that requires very little preparation. Right? You had your Thanksgiving dinner, you got some cold turkey, you go and you eat it. Big deal, you don't have to do anything. But that means to quit Cold turkey is to do so suddenly and without preparation. Don't say, oh, let me finish this and then I'm going to stop. Let me go and have a conversation with this individual and let me fix this and let me do this. No, no, no. Stop, stop, stop. You're nurturing the sin. Don't even say goodbye. End the sin. That's it. You have to stop it. And it says here, the sin began with a choice, and it must end with a choice. You can't throw it on God after you did everything that you wanted to do. No, no, you started it, you stop it with the help of God. It's not enough to say, I won't tell as many lies today as I did yesterday. <laughs> no, we have to say, I will not be a liar anymore. Don't gloss it over. Don't make it sound nice. It's ugly. So just end the ugliness. Number three, replace the sin with godly behavior. Mm -hmm. And remember, these are all choices. This is all about self-control. Not that we can totally stop every single thing that comes against us, but there are some things that we can stop. There are some conversations that we can end. There are some people that we do not have to talk to. There are some things that we do not have to put before our eyes. We make the choice to press the button on the computer. We make the choice to read the book. We make the choice to go and visit the person. We make the choice to have the telephone conversation. We make the choice to spend the money. No one is forcing us. However, we need to be very careful that we do not continue in those things. So, we need to replace our sin with godly behavior. That's step number three. We can't just take something away or we leave behind the vacuum. So it's not enough to stop the sin. We have to replace it with something good. So let's say, for example, you're a person that's forever cursing. Well, you know what? Learn some songs that are of God. And when you're about to curse, sing the song. I remember um, a counselor telling a mom that she, he, the, the mother and the daughter came for counseling because they were always bickering. And that's annoying when you hear two people going at it all the time. So the mother told, I'm sorry, the counselor told the mother, this is what you need to do. When you're about to argue with your daughter, get up and dance. And that's what the mother did. She said that she thought about that. That's so dumb. But when she was about to argue with her daughter, she got up and danced. And the daughter danced with her. And it entirely changed their relationship. Because the negativity was replaced with something positive. And that is something that we need to be able to do also. One thing that I do personally, maybe I'm feeling a little bit down, even sick. I might go and work out. And that will change my, my ideas. That will change my mindset. And that will help me to get away from the doldrums or whatever it is. Because we cannot stay in the same place and expect different results. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. So yes. we have to replace the bad with something good. Paul speaks of this in Ephesians chapter 4. Where he, he replaces falsity with honest living. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. He replaces stealing. With honest living, he replaces falsity with truth, and he replaces foul language with beneficial words and graceful words. That's up to us. We must choose to do these things. Paul says, and a commentator says, that it's not enough, for example, if a person is a thief, to stop, see to stop stealing and, and do nothing else. No, you're a, you're a thief who's currently not stealing. But now you must get a job and give 
unto the Lord. So not only are you not stealing, now you're working and you're giving to benefit someone else. When in the past you stole and you took from other individuals. So you can't just stop the negative behavior. You must replace it with a godly behavior. Mm. That was step number three. And step number four, realize that you have an outside source of strength. God did not make us to go at things alone. God has given us each other. God has given us families. Now, unfortunately, there may be some family members that you cannot talk to because they're not going to help you because perhaps they are deeper in sin than you are or than, than I am. However, God has given you godly brothers and sisters. God has given you his own word. God has given you the ability to pray and to seek the Lord. So we have to realize that we have an outside sort of source of strength that we never have to fight the sin alone. The overriding presence of Jesus Christ is with us at all times. We can never say Jesus is not with me. That would be the ultimate lie. Jesus is with us all the time. Amen. You know what? Even when we committed the sin, Jesus was with us. And that's okay. That's not to bring a, a condemnation on anyone here. Jesus loves us. And whatever it was that was affecting us, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that it was affecting us. It's no longer affecting us. Now, we can testify of the Savior, the Savior Jesus Christ, pulling us out from there mm -hmm. and how he can help other individuals. So don't be stuck on the shame of the past, but on what Jesus can now do with your past. As I read about um, Christine Kane earlier, severely abused as a, as a child, then not, find, not knowing that she was adopted, finding out as an adult, that changed her world. But she used it to honor God. God. So we have to realize that we have an outside source, source of strength, which is the overriding presence of Jesus Christ. And then, to, to sum everything up, Roberts, whom I quoted earlier, says, The believer does not kill his bad personality or the sins outright, but pushes back into the grave what is already there but leaking out. Because remember, the old man is dead. When he's resurrecting, we need to know he is dead. By actively considering us, considering ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ, we bring it about that we are actually more dead to sin and more alive to God in Christ. So when we are about to sin, we can say, no, that is not me. I don't have to do this. I belong to Jesus. I don't have to indulge this conversation. I don't have to respond to this person. I don't have to go to that place. That was the old me. The new me is alive. That person is dead. And when Satan comes to accuse us, we can say, I don't know what you're talking about. That person no longer exists. That person died a long time ago. They are buried. They are gone. I don't know them. I am a new creation in Christ. In other words, the Lord has made provision for us with the power of Christ's resurrection. So we do not have to be stuck in the old. We don't have to dwell there. We don't even have to visit. We know that Jesus Christ has taken care of us. He has freed us. He has given us strength. And through the power of his resurrection, our old sin nature has stayed in the tomb and we have been resurrected with Christ also. We are alive. And we do not have to cater to sin. Amen. 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 Amen.